Okay, so we are going to start. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this very exciting reading. Well, it's a, it's a lecture and then a poetry reading by Dr. Nikita Dede Ajinkor. My name is Suba Xavier, and I'm the interim director of the Institute of African Studies. Um, before I begin, I want to just um, let you know about some exciting things happening at the IAS. One of them is we are we have a logo contest happening right now. So any undergraduates or graduate students who have some artistic talents, we want to welcome you to send in a logo for the IAS. Um, if you're interested, please come um, see me and I'll happily share some information about it. But we would love to see your art. Um, the next is that we have a film series of three films by a Congolese director. His name is Petna Andelico Katandolo, and he'll be here next week. And so his films will be playing, uh, will be screened on March 5th, and again on March 7th, and then on March 7th in this very room, he is going, we're going to watch one of his films, and he's going to do a master class. Uh, so his master class is called Ancestral Filming Ancestral Ecologies in the Congo. I hope you will join us. And it's right before spring break. So what better way to send you off on your one week of race? <clears throat> so on behalf of the IS at Emory, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third of three lectures this year by Africa-based scholars. This lecture series was made possible by generous funding from our dean's office, to build connection between Emory University, faculty and students, scholars, and scholars and um, uh, um, uh, guests who are doing exciting work on the African continent. Dr. Nikita Dede Ajirakor's visit in particular was co-sponsored by the Hightower Fund, the Departments of English, African American Studies, and the Programs in Global Postcolonial Studies and Creative Writing. So I want to I want to welcome uh, my colleague, Dr. Nathan Sir Seitzma, who many of you know, who is going to come up and do the introduction for our guest. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Feel free to move closer if you want. Um, Dr. Nikita Dede Ajirakor joins us from the University of Ghana, where she's a postdoctoral fellow funded by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. She earned her PhD from the University of Bayreuth, Germany. Her doctoral research focused on hip hop and spoken word poetry in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I was lucky to hear her present from her research uh, at a conference a few years back where she was thinking through the vibe of performance poetry, not only as an aesthetic experience, but also as a form of non-representational knowledge. Dr. Ajira Kaur is herself a poet the author of a compelling chapbook entitled Learning to Say My Name. It was published in 2023 as part of a New Generation African Poets chapbook box set edited by Kwame Dawes and Chris Abani. Um, these chapbook box sets have been published for about a decade now. Um, every year, it's kind of seven to a dozen um, poets who haven't had a full length collection. It's really become kind of an annual event in African poetry. As the title, Learning to Say My Name, might suggest, the fraught inheritance and performance of language is at the heart of many of her poems, along with meditations on the body and on family lineage. She was telling me that writing the chapbook was a post-PhD COVID project, and a second such project, a book for children entitled Black and Bold Queens, Women in Ghana's History, was also published last year. Um, so you had a much more productive COVID <laughs> experience than, than I did. Um, as if that weren't enough, she has been active as a filmmaker, as a founder of Write Ghana initiatives to showcase Ghanaian languages and literatures. Her postdoctoral research spans languages and texts from both the West and East coasts of Africa. And I'm very excited to hear her talk today, digital Afrophone literature, marginalized languages, and digital geographies. Dr. Ajirakor has generously taken time to be with us for events and for classes over the last week. And so on behalf of the Institute of African Studies, I hope you'll join me in showing our appreciation for her work and for her presence with us today.
I thank you so much for a very generous introduction. Um, yeah, before I speak, I just want to thank Emory University for inviting me to Suba, to Nathan, um, Department of English, French and Italian, especially to Jackie also for the amazing logistics and everything that was put together. So today's talk is going to be two parts. I'm going to give a talk about my academic work. So this is my current postdoctoral research at the University of Ghana. And then I'm going to do a very short poetry reading to introduce you to some of my poetry, which over the last nine days that I've been here, we've had the opportunity in some of the classes to discuss not just short stories, but also some of the poetry that features in my film. Um, my talk today is titled Digital Afrophone Literature, Marginalized Languages and Digital Geographies. And this is part of my bigger postdoctoral research where I'm very interested in how African languages and African literatures move through the internet and move through the digital space. And so very simply, my question through my work is what happens when a digital text is conce conceived, it's circulated, and then it's consumed in an African language, especially within the very Anglophone dominated nature of the digital space. And so for this presentation, I just want to give you kind of an overview of emerging literary networks and specifically the interplay when we think about texts in African languages, literature, digital networks. So why is this, why is this an important question? Like I said earlier, there's a huge proliferation of digital technologies in Africa, especially through cell phones, but there's still a very big digital gap, a very big digital divide when you think about Anglophone, English, and especially indigenous African languages. And so digital networks, these operate um, but are not inextricable from local, political, social, linguistic, and cultural dimensions. And so these means that languages need to have input and output cap capability, um, and you need corresponding software, you need applications, you need hardware, which attune us to the historical trajectories of the ways in which languages move offline. Because a lot of the times, the offline linguistic dimensions and language values of the language are what are then replicated online into the digital space. And so my argument for my postdoc is really that when we think about digitality and literature, we must always take into account the linguistic values that then move through the digital space. And so I'm thinking here about text, but also about platforms. And in terms of platforms, the popular ones would be Facebook, Twitter, blogs, YouTube, Wattpad. But I'm very interested in smaller independent spaces through which African languages move, primarily ones that only support African language literature. So these in, in themselves are very marginalized spaces because they are actively supported by individuals, privately funded writers themselves who are creating these spaces. And so an example of this is Market 54, which you can see on the screen. Market 54 is an online website. Um, it's a website that primarily just publishes and sells literature in African languages, all with translations in English. And so these include audiobooks, ebooks, paperbacks. You can get one text in different forms with translation also on the side. And so as the founder of the platform tells me, her name is Mark, um, there's a lack of narratives in African languages, especially a kind of one-stop shop. Think about Amazon, right? And one-stop shop where you can get a variety of languages, a variety of genres. And you can even see this in the name, Market 54. This is reflecting and referencing the number of the countries in Africa. As you can see on their homepage here, English translations of a Somali story. You can see stories in Amharic, stories in Ga, in Kinyarwanda, Somali, different languages, different forms, different media. So all of this occurs and is propelled by the digital. And so this means that the digital space does something. It enables something to happen. And in my work, I think about this through the concept of affordances. Um, affordances primarily comes from digital design theory, but has been used by literary scholar Karina Levine to think about the way forms work. And so she argues that instead of us thinking about what artists and things do, we have to think about what potentialities lie latent in them. And so what do things afford? What do they allow us to do even without us being aware of the potentialities that exist in the things? And so a table, we would sing a thing that a table is for putting things on a table, but you can't sit on a table. A table can be broken down into different places, into different things. And so this leads me here to my first claim that in the digital space, when we think about its interaction with literature, its interaction with language and with form, 
it affords us a sense of multiplicity, which means that we go beyond homogeneous ideas of language and homogeneous ideas of form. And in terms of production, practice, and circulation, the base becomes multiple things. And so this has multiple considerations for thinking about text, especially when it comes to African languages, where you have this binary between oral and written literature. Rather than thinking about the difference between oral and literature, in this case, both simultaneously exist. Multiple things exist. And digital platforms then help us to exploit this fluidity because a story can exist as an audiobook, as an ebook, in a language can be translated into multiple forms. You don't have one existing as the as the original with an afterthought coming I mean, after afterwards. And so I'm focusing here specifically on the book titled Kenke Party, which with the, the Ghana translation Comic Kenan by the writer Oyuni Owu where we can see here the existence of multiple forms here, English and Ga. There's also a bilingual version, and they also exist as print, audiobook, and there's an audio uh, um, audiobook coming out soon. Now, this book was published by um, Oyo Niowu, and in the story, there's an anthropomorphized ball of Kenke. So Kenke is a bald, fermented condo, and the ball of Kenke, you can see proudly standing there, escapes from a boiling pan, to avoid being cooked for a party organized by a group of children. The Kenke's escape terms from its astonishment that the children do not have the usual traditional accompaniments of fried, freshly fried fish and ground, a ground mixture of pepper and tomatoes. And so the children's story, um, within it, there's a lively chase through the city and they get to the sea where the children learn about the culinary traditions of fried fish. And when the Kenke realizes that there, there is fish, it returns happily to be eaten. So to give you a context of the language, the accurate number of Ghana speakers is quite contentious in Ghana because Ghana's national census only counts ethnic affiliation and not language use. And so in this context also, Ghana is often lumped together with its closest language relative, Dangbe, and within it you have Gadangbe, which is what is counted in the national census. And so the national census in 2021 estimated there were about 2 million out of Ghana's population that's identified as the Gadangbe, so we don't actually know if they speak Gadangbe and which one they speak. We just know ethnic affiliation. But Ga is estimated to have about a million L1 speakers. Now, English is the official language of Ghana. There is no national language. But the most significant policy towards a multilingual educational and literary space is the use of the dominant language of the region as the medium of instruction in schools. Although a lot of scholars have argued that this is ineffective because textbooks are often written in English, and teachers without mother tongue competency are often posted to schools across the country where they are unable to teach the language of the region. And so in effect, the very few written literary publications you get in Ga are either textbooks for learning Ga or creative works to accompany the curriculum written by governmental agencies. Private publishing institutions are usually textbook dominated and much like in other African countries, are wary of publishing books in Ghanaian languages because they view them as non-commercial. And so in the digital landscape, this becomes even more precarious because Ghana, like what Metal and Jason refer to as low resource languages on the internet are not adequately supported to be put up there. So it's within this context of Ghana, this context of indigenous languages that um, Naoyo Niu writes this text. For now, the impetus that drove the book was her young nephew's misplaced idea about the source of fish as the grocery store rather than a water-based body like the sea. Historically, the Gans are coastal dwellers, and so the sea is central to the Ga culture. Um, traditions like the there's a yearly month-long ban on fishing to allow the sea to recuperate. Um, and all of these are meant to emphasize communal Ga renewal. But now your nephew, however, was unaware of this cultural aspect. It's also important to note that Na and her nephew lived in Canada. And so she was interested in writing the book because she wanted to impact mother tongue acquisition, but she also wanted to create a book that was culturally relevant for her nephew, even though they lived in the diaspora. And so my argument here is that Ga here is not simply a language, but it's actually an orientation through which they are located in the world. And the Ga book becomes a way for her nephew to imagine and find his world, which is not delineated only to the physical location of Accra or the physical geography of Ghana, but ends up straddling Accra, West Accra, Ghana, Africa, and North America. So what we hear again is this idea of multiplicity, 
located between these different worlds and these different lived experiences. Um, and so these geographies then mean that location really matters in ensuring sensitivity to the complex, multiple, local, global imaginaries that exist here in the text. And so you can see that we have four overlapping kind of experiences, right? There's a Ghana world, there's a Ghanaian world, a diasporic world, and a digital world. Mm. In the text, there's this insistence on narrating a cultural identity and accompanying online reading and discussion sessions of the book, which I follow through the digital space, already always echo how digital literature, digital literature is in place in cyberspace rather than being placeless in this huge democratic um, homogeneous virtual space. Ghana literature here becomes a deliberate attempt to narrate a Ghana identity and community across borders. So while Na is diasporic based, her text is unmistakably rooted in a local Ghanaian world without aspirations of belonging to a more global space. And so it is the real cultural and culinary tradition and connection to the sea that informs the narrative's origins in the narrative's context. I'm focusing here on the diaspora because there have been a lot of discussions about what the diaspora means in relation to African literature and how these often tend tease out the anxieties around nationality. So what does it mean when a Nigerian writer based in Canada wins an African award for writing, right? But a lot of these discussions have only focused on African literature in English or African literature in other languages, but not in Afri Afrophone literatures. And a lot of the times what we get here is a kind of division and disconnect between the digital space and between the diaspora and home. So there's a diaspora and there's a home. But we have been asked by some scholars to view the diaspora not as a function of a stable, not as a stable entity, but to look at it as a function. What does the diaspora do? And I, when I think about it in line with my idea of affordances, this means that what does the diaspora afford us and whose world and what, whose and what world, whose diaspora is then being embodied in this text? In this book, there is no articulation of a return to a specific ga home as in people in the diaspora moving back to a Ghana home. Rather, <laughs> discussions about the book often lend to discussions about the texture of a Ghana diaspora. Often with Zoom as the location, there, is the, there are discussions about the memory and the myth of a Ghana community, which is often propelled by the language. Participants view the text as a strategy for sustaining Ghana language and culture among children, whether in the diasporic spaces or in Ghana. But all of these are rooted in real anxieties about the future of the language in real life, but also online. In the digital space, they can recreate a Ghana community that is anchored by the text to contest real geographies of power, which allows them to position themselves from a subaltern perspective to signal belonging between multiple spaces. In my work, I'm particularly reading authors like Naoyo through this talking of a literary activist where their social media role and their digital role helps them to consecrate themselves as spokespeople for African literature. So I'm not speaking only about their works, but also about the paratext that surround their work. So their personhood, the aesthetics around their personhood, their presence on social media, the activities that they build digitally. And I'm borrowing here from Madhu Krishnan's work about where she argues that the constitution and colonization of African literature at least in the story most visible in the global literary field, has always relied on a series of totemic figures and mythical moments and founding moments. In the contemporary era, with the omnipresence of digital technologies, the hyperactive space-time compression of blogs, podcasting, broadcasting, and the immediacy of social media, the role of the writer as star has intensified, ampl amplifying the anxieties, tensions, and ambiguities which attend the dual mandate of the writer as artist and writer as spokesperson. And so often when these discussions happen, we see them around Anglophone writers who are attached to major metropolitan publishing houses like Chimamanda Adichie, um, Tejuko, where the author becomes a power broker who then mediates value for African literature. But what does this mean when we think about Afrophone literature? Here, this role of activists is unavoidable because writers must fulfill the role of writer as spokesperson without being attached to global literary spaces thereby creating alternative houses that they need for their often marginalized literary networks. A writer like Na Oyo wields her praxis deliberately as a tool for advocacy to make Ghana language and literature visible and valuable in the larger literary field 
when compared to languages like English. For instance, she self-funded the production of her book, collaborated with Market 54 for its publication, self-funded its paperback. Due to the non-commercial value attached to Ghanaian languages by Ghanaian publishing houses, the digital space enables her to connect with specialized publishers like Market 54, connect with readers through online reading sessions that they create themselves, which in turn drives the sales of her book. So rather than simply writing the book and submitting to a publishing house, she must utilize her presence to drive the trajectory, especially if we think about the reduced presence and the lack of a template really for such writers. If we read her through the token of activists, then we must begin to turn her attention not only to the book, but also to her activities. So as an activist, she works with writers and creators and has her own nonprofit project that she calls Afro Literacies Foundation, described on the website as a think tank for indigenous African languages that engages with Africa's linguistic diversity. Here, as an activist, she consecrates her work and her paratextual activities as a central driver in the practices that mediate the contours of Ghana literature online and offline, because Afro Literacies Foundation also funds people who want to learn Ghana in the university. But part of such corporations is rooted not only in literature, but there is an attempt to reimagine what technology looks like and to produce a more inclusive digital space. There, are, there have been lots of renewed calls for urgent oversight into how technology, especially digital technology, harms marginalized bodies, especially how this harm is encoded into the infrastructure. So we think of things like voice recognition, we think about facial rec voice technology, facial recognition, which can often replicate racial and gendered bias. But what happens here when language is a role? I argue that language actually plays a very critical role that can help us to rethink the way in which technology should work. If we think about digitality, we have to think about fluency. Because to use the internet, you have to understand the internet, but you also need to know how to type. And it sounds very basic, but critical access to the internet requires this fluency. And African languages have been largely excluded in this process with underrepresentation in aspects like voice recognition, machine learning, et cetera. For instance, Google Translate has supports 133 languages, but only 21 of these are African languages. On Wikipedia, African languages are responsible for only about 1% of its total content. And so the digital language gap is not just for languages simply being there, but it's also in the ways in which the languages are being used. And I argue here that here is an opportunity to use literature and to use language to render a new imagination of the digital space. Because to use a language and to demand its appropriate tools in itself is a political and an activist act. And one of the ways in which this works is with debates around orthography and font. Writers in English simply have to produce their stories, but writers in certain languages, especially marginalized languages, have the challenge of digital technologies not being accessible to them. On one hand, this contrast reinforces the othering and the marginalization, but on the other hand, produces a critical moment for writers and readers to actively intervene and to place their languages online. It is from such discussions about the font that this a company, Asiedu Information Systems Limited, created a keyboard for Ghanaian and African language writers that includes various alphabets not found on the standard QWERTY layout. What they call the ABEDE, ABEDE keyboard, which is sounding out ABD in certain languages. It enables writers in languages that are pushed to the periphery to reclaim their language on the internet. And this is no trivial for African languages because such a tangible physical tool it radically makes the literature and the language visible. And so we see that rather than using um, for writers and for readers, rather than using a three instead of the, the vowel sound a, e, or using an o instead of sound o, you actually have this font on the keyboard to be able to use the right keyboard. Beyond Ga, I'm going to use the example of the language Ewe, which is a Bay language that is constituted between Ghana, Togo, and Benin. I followed a writing session and a reading session of Ewe online between the fiction writer Gifty Baka, meant to instruct Ewe writers in how to write in Ewe. During the session, Gifty paused and threatened to stop the session when some Ewe alphabet in her presentation did not show as a result of the wrong font being used. Wrong font here being the regular font, not showing away language and away vowels. 
this pause was momentous and her desire to have the right funds overtly emphasized to the participants the social and political significance of using the right font, a debate that will not occur during an English language session. As the participants generally echoed, the right alphabet is a political tool for them. And so these moments turn our attention to the fact that for marginalized languages, the digital literary production also includes an activist role for ensuring the sustainability of the language. What happens then when we consider the medium of digitality itself? What does digitality afford? I'd like to focus here on the example of a tree poem titled Impuano by the poet Essa Samoa. To think about how Twitter's dialogic structure affects the poem, and what this means for the digital spaces affordances. This follows another, um, another session that I followed online for um, the publication of three poems. Essa Samoa's work was published online by a blog. The poem itself is a critique of Ghana's, plague, uh, Ghana's place in contemporary Pan-African thought, using the image of the seashore to reflect upon significant events like the slave trade, independence, and neoliberalism. When he shared his poem on Twitter, another reader immediately shared the poem. And when she shared it, she wrote of her wish to listen to an audio version of the poem, so to assess the poem in a different form, in an oral form. Within a few hours, without the intervention of the writer, the poet, or the blog, another reader, another participant, had recorded himself performing the poem against the background of the guitar. So you can see the original poem on the, on the left, and then you can see the sharing of the recorded video on the right. Here we can see that the text then takes on multiple lives with unofficial forms. Unofficial here meaning that without the intervention of the writer or the blog, where readers themselves take the initiative to reshape the story, reshape its materiality and form. Um, James Yaku has written about the writerly intervention of the reader and how this allows to transgressively recraft canonical ideas of African literature, which simply means that the digital can help to collapse authorial boundaries, and the reader can then contribute also to the meaning of the text and its praxis. But this is very fundamental in digital Afrofone literature, as I've already shown with the discussion about fonts. Readers are, themselves are vital to the process of production and not necessarily as recipients of a finished product. This is especially vital because they see themselves as being at the basis of a language that is still emerging in use on the internet and that they are able to participate in how their languages show up. Here, questions of orthography and convention come into play because keyboards are still being invented for some of these languages. In the poem in Puano, we see that the begin we see a beginning of a spontaneous reader online co collaboration that changes the textual form without the intervention of the original author. But here, it is because it is on Twitter, the very form of Twitter, its structure as a dialogue that enables this collaboration. As the first reader shares the original poem, she extends it to her audience. She extends here also her writing about the original poem. And this shapes and reshapes the original audience for her poem. In this sense, her writing becomes part of the new paratext for the poem, seen together with the original poem. It is here the very dialogic structure of Twitter which redefines the way in which the audience then relates to the poem. And important to note that when on the, on the right hand part, when this is shared, it is shared without the original poem. So if you simply happen to come upon the poem by Do the Kin, which is a recording, you will not know that there was actually a previous poem that had been shared on Twitter because he did not share the previous poem. So here we see that the, active, the audience take an active role in constructing new meanings for the poem. And it is the very structure here where the audience comment is placed on top of the original content that enables the audience to shape how the new poem is consumed. This means that Twitter's own rituals for sharing, retweeting, liking, reposting, and sharing are not simply rituals that expose the taste of the audience. These are rituals themselves that are part of the literary practice affording writerly intervention of the reader and altering the story to suit the reader audience. Um, in her research, Boss Santana has argued that Facebook for, creates for writing and reading communities and relies on the formation of community to create a relationship between re reader and audience. The story here is then often built around the idea of intimate collaboration where in her work, Zulu is viewed as an incorporation of everyday lived experiences. 
Facebook's orientation, I argue, is different from Twitter's structure because Twitter as a source of news in real-time reporting an interactive source of rapid information produces an authorizing facility. And with its use of previously limited characters, directs readers to create a rapid sense of collaboration that is more tuned to the reader's rhizomatic needs, interests, and different audiences. So Facebook, I'm arguing, is more inward towards the original text, and Twitter looks more outward towards new text, including comments and shares. The new point that is performed through the a new medium of video caters to a new multi multitude of audience and inscribes a new author. In the video, the poem begins with written by, well, you can see that, but the, in the video, the poem begins with written by, S. Asamoa, and ends with narrated by, Do the Kumi creating two authors to the poem's different forms. And so more than inter interaction or collaboration, there is an ample opportunity for an unexpected engagement between readers and authors. I would like to now turn to the, the example of Swahili in Tanzania, looking at poetry and WhatsApp. Um, I'm focusing on the group Waka Poetry Consortium, which is a poetry group that focuses on nurturing the writing skills of poems, of poets rather than performance. Held in both English and Swahili, it features a loose group of members who show up fortnightly to events in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam with meetings for three to four hours. So it is a physical group, but it is very much more alive as a digital group with about 100 members on its WhatsApp group. What I'm interested in touching in here is the way in which the WhatsApp as a digital space reimagines and reshapes existing poetic discourses about language and form. In this sense, WhatsApp is not merely a platform, a trivial platform upon which poetry is shared, but it reforms the poetry itself. Language remains one of the most contested discourses in poetry in Tanzania, where the general tension between Swahili and English play out. Swahili as the language through which Tanzania as a new independent nation was created and chosen to represent the country, but English as a language that continued to stay in Tanzania, so as both official and national languages. On WhatsApp, these tensions are tapped into, where the boundaries of the group, membership, access to who is allowed to write poetry are shaped according to these tensions. There are a lot of WhatsApp groups in poetry in Tanzania, and a lot of these groups are Swahili only, which means that if you join the group, you have to agree, agree to only write in Swahili. If you write in English, you are kicked off the group. Waka is different because Waka allows both languages. During the group meetings, both languages coexist as well as in the WhatsApp group. But this doesn't mean that the tensions that exist in poetry don't exist here. Here, WhatsApp groups are seen as boundary defining because they define their identity of the writer, both as poetic, but also a national identity. To be Tanzanian poet then is to write in Swahili and to belong to a Swahili WhatsApp group. But in Waka, we see that it enables poets to choose and to inscribe their identities along their poetic and language lines. Similarly, debate on the form of poetry. If you write in Swahili, you have to write in strict prosodic rules of what is termed as the shairi genre, which means that your, your poetic lines have to go A, B, A, B, A, X. Whereas if you write in English, you can write in free verse. So these are discussions that are bound completely in the group where if an English writer chooses to write in a shairi form, there's a discussion about what this means for the national identity of Tanzania. If a Swahili writer decides to write in free verse, there's a discussion about what this means also for Swahili freedom. And so such contested discourses continue to shape the use of the WhatsApp group. And although at the moment Waka describes itself as an open group, a free group, I have been following this group for the last nine years. And I would argue that we are seeing now more and more Swahili poets join the group and more and more English poets join the group feeling that they are not part of the contested identity of what it means to be a Tanzanian poet in Swahili. And so rather than being simply a trivial space, WhatsApp acts as a space to reinforce existing poetic discourses on language and on poetry. And so to conclude, I would just like to mention that we can see in the use of trees, Swahili, echoing now used use of gum, a deliberate world building efforts, one that places the languages in the same space where English is dominantly used. I must mention that majority of the comments for the tree poem displayed regret for not being able to read the poem fluently or a desire to see a word where tree poetry appeared normal and not out of the norm. 
as the poem itself was not produced on Twitter to tweet or through tweets, but rather multiple versions of it shared on Twitter, we see again a different way of using Twitter. These rituals then act as catalysts for the actualization of the text. Critical reflections of the digital space must examine how non-dominant non languages use the space, but also how they are produced to the space. Spaces are not simply trivial spaces, uh, trivial places that exist, but actually there is an inherent link between space practice and the political. In particular, within the anglophone dominated digital space and infrastructure, English might appear as its default settings, but it is necessary to redefine this because digital spaces require real human input to be encoded. The use of these languages and literary practices online are deliberate attempts to reshape the values around the languages. In contexts where indigenous languages are marginalized, it is easy to replicate these power imbalances online and reproduce long-standing ideas about languages. But it is essential for us because we need to intervene in the way in which digital spaces are being used. And I believe that such an intervention must begin by taking the question of language seriously. It is essential to recognize how authors and readers are producing relationally their literary practices in hitherto unknown and unused spaces especially to become attuned to their many world building efforts in placing these languages and literatures online in spaces that are dominated by other languages. Thank you. I just, okay, so. Um, okay, so just to switch from the academic side, to go to the more creative side. I'm going to read a few poems from my chapbook, as Nathan said, was published by um, Akashic Books, the African Poetry Book Fund. And my book was one of, my chapbook is one of 11 books in the box set that came out last year. Um, so I'm going to read five poems and then just as a matter of time and to give time for Q&A, then we can have um, Q&A for this and then academic writing. So the first poem I'm going to read is titled, In the Hospital. I cannot tell you when we begin to fold in, into each other, my mother and I, even though there is a door separating us. While she is held together by middle-aged women, shaking and whimpering in her kaba, told to grieve properly by swallowing herself, I am fastened to a bed by a doctor who touches me like I am the lake he wants to drown in. I choke on my whispered, I've never been touched like that before as the doctor scoffs because I am seen he has uncovered and the nurse mutters sorry like a calculated prayer. Says I am a university girl as he spreads my knees. Says I must like doing it with the boys as his hands plunge between my thighs. Says he is the act before a husband as the nurse strokes my forehead. I want to tape my moans into his mouth and show him surrender. But these moans are familiar. A library of the woman who raised me and these moans are in my head like a trophy searching for wounds to breathe in. So the second poem I will read is titled Lineage. My mother tongue fights behind stippled teeth that only loosen for other languages. Sometimes it inches through my gap tooth, punctuating each sentence with O and A, a discordant for symphony that announces its foreignness. The instructor asks, asks, what is your native language? Where native means mother tongue, which means my father's tongue, which was removed when his mouth contoured into a home for a different self. The instructor asks surprised, which language did you speak first? My grandfather asks surprised, which language are you speaking now? When my grandfather says nape, it means his surprise happens in Ga, which literally means his mouth is stitched together, which suggests we do not speak, we cannot speak which is to say trauma is buried in his tongue into mine. I build a home out of loss and split myself to sow his embarrassment into me. In Ga, I thirst for his shame. In here, Igbo, literally his face is dead because death is the lineage I have inherited. The instructor asks again, I mean, what was your local language before you were colonized? I've been running my tongue enough times over my gap tooth to know the ache I feel as it widens is my grandfather emerging from my mouth. I know it's the only space left to pack and unpack who we are not. Mm -hmm. 
And the third poem I would read is titled, Home is Not Here in This Body. I too want to remember how to wear my body again. In this house, everything remains unfinished and we mistake resignation for patience. I was named after a father's hope, a future appointment that leaves me untethered in the present. Perhaps this is why I fold into myself, close my fists and wait for the world's permission to become. When your name is a stranger, faith is what wears your feet through each door that arrives at nothingness. I ask myself, what is faith, if not the emptiness I choke on while washing it down with possibility? Yet mother tells me faith is all we have, and when I filter the world through her gaze, I see her again. Longing for a lover's promise, waiting for a daughter's survival. In my body, everything remains unfinished, and I mistake emptiness for peace. I am at war with myself. Home is not here in this body. On another trip to the emergency room, I ask the doctor to find myself and pass them on to me. These hands are free to grasp them like a desperate prayer. When your name is a stranger, you learn that just because a thing is alive does not mean it is whole. By that I mean I have forgotten how to wear a body that is whole. Home is not here in this body. I mean, even as I meet myself with violence, speak tenderness into me. And the fourth poem I would read is titled, Woman Waits for Ultrasound to Turn Colorful. Hope does not want these legs growing thinner descending to the ground. But these legs tap music into hope, each rhythm creating holy ground and slitting the throat of the night to reveal the texture of a love beyond survival. My parents loved me in grayscale, each grain planting new names on their tongues till I reached out and touched God in their mouths. I apologize when I talk about my body, whisper defective before quoting poetry about mothers hemorrhaging into fertile lands and planting stories synonymous to decay. Like the moment my mother began as a mother and the doctor neatly tagged her insides as blood trickled down her legs. She hid parts of herself around the globe, tied together by her scars slowly decaying till they turned into dust and a quivering madness, a most spectacular madness. As these legs grow thinner towards the earth, they snake around searching for my mother's selves to teach me to love in grayscale, to love these grains that only use me to search for places to bloom. And the last one I'll read is titled Becoming a Mother. Lately, I've been nourishing these tumors inside me, thinking of myself as a mother, running my hands over my rounded body and looking for a heartbeat that isn't there. Perhaps there's something to be said about madness about finding consolation, consolation in a swollen body that is an empty home, simply because it is a sign of possibility. I've been trying to find language that does not swallow my consolation. And no matter how they say it, sorry, ho, oh, oh, there is something disrespectful about how they choke on my solace, as if finding consolation in a wound that has made a home out of me is not too an act of love. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this was outstanding. I have been to too many talks the past few weeks, and this like lit up my life. Um, a lot of the work that you do is really similar to um, some of the stuff that I'm interested in, especially um, regarding performing security. Art, um, but it seems like you wear many hats. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if I heard right. You're working on a film. I made a film like you made a film? seven years ago. Oh my god, it was a long time okay. ago. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you um, could just speak to how all of these different aspects of your life inform each other. Um, how have you negotiating, organizing yeah. them, um, and how you like make different projects? Right. Um, how they intersect, how they uh, separate. That's a very selfish question for me. Yeah. Stuff, but yeah, no, it's it's an important question. I think it's good to recognize that these things they didn't happen overnight, and I didn't do them in one year. Like Nathan mentioned, when I finished my PhD and I submitted the PhD in the in the five months, because I was just having a discussion with two grad students about how long it takes to submit and defend here, and in Germany, you know, it takes like five months, five to six months. And so in those five to six months where I was completely exhausted and drained after submission, and this was just after the first lockdown was lifted, I didn't want to do anything academic. And that is how 
the poetry came out and that is how that's when I started writing the poetry and that's when I started working on a children's book once I came came back in quote to writing academic stuff I paused those and so the way I schedule my work is that I um I try to give myself one thing a year that is not academic and so maybe this year I work on this children's book and then next year I work on this so that I don't burn out also a lot of the things I do are inspiration actually from my academic work. And so I should mention that a lot of the poems and the film came out because I was in the field with a lot of creative people. So I wasn't in the university, in the library working that I just, you know, had inspiration to do these things. It was in the field and that's, I had time in the field because I was in the field for 13 months. And so I was able to do all of these things. Um, now, the way, like I said, the way I schedule it is that I just think about one thing a year. Whereas it, it does look like, I mean, I did have two books come out last year, but I didn't work on them last year. You know, the poetry started in 2020, the children's book started in 2021. So the, it takes time and I give myself that time because I am I cannot do everything in one moment. I also give myself a lot of time for the inspiration. So sometimes these will be questions that I'm thinking about academically, but I don't know how to address them academically because it's not my field. So I'm not a historian. And so when I was thinking about women in Ghana's history, I could not address it as an academic article, you know, as a, as a historian, because I'm not a historian. And so the way I could do it was through creative writing. And at that moment, I was, you know, hanging out with a lot of children. And so I was curious about doing that. That's how all these things came together. But now it does sound like a lot, but it, I mean, the film was, we started working on the film in 2016, came out in 2018. So it takes time, a lot of time. Thank you. Yeah. What would it take to facilitate, uh, I guess, a digital economy that's conducive to African literature? Mm -hmm. Because I think there was a period of moving away from African to more English, and I hope the inverse is happening currently. So I guess the first question is, do you think the environment is made for it or would it take to facilitate that growth so it continues to help lose the money to come to? That's a difficult question. It's a multifaceted thing. Now use Ga book, for instance, sells a lot among Ga people in the diaspora, but not so much in Ghana because people are more happy to read an English book with their kids because English is the language of education. English is what you read, what you do in school. Um, but you also have the issue, and I think this is really rooted in Ghana's multilingual policy. And I'll contrast this with um, Tanzania's policy. In Ghana, we are a multilingual nation in theory. In practice, what this means is that English is the language of value in all these spaces. And the educational system, like I said, we all, we, we all study Ghanaian languages till junior high school. It's the, it's, the, it's the subject in the national exam that is failed the most. And so Ghanaian languages and French are the subjects that majority of students fail. We, we do a system of one to nine, one being the highest, nine being the lowest grade that you can get in the national exam. And routinely, Ghanaian languages and French, people get between seven and nine because they do not see these as important things to be studied. And also in the case, it's like, I speak a Ghanaian language, why do I need to study it in school? What this means is that from the educational standpoint, from the familial standpoint, there isn't a lot of support for the creation of text in these languages because your audience is very limited in the first place. I think that there has been since 2020, a very huge renewed interest in Ghanaian languages, in African languages in general. And I think this is because of the sudden acknowledgement of the threats. There are a lot of languages that in the last five years have been argued that are now endangered, so classified as endangered. Gadangbe, for instance, is classified as an endangered language in, a, in two generations. It's a language that will not really exist. And so now, for instance, the government of Ghana acknowledges this and have I have proposed the bill in parliament a week ago that parliament should be a multilingual space. So anyone should be able to use any Ghanaian language that they use in order to, um, for the proceedings in parliament. I think that there's a lot of private work being done. 
But I do think that without governmental support across the continent, this is not something that will work. It's also very important to note that when we think about African languages and we think about the use of African languages and how you know, the concept of Pan-Africanism, which is the way in which a lot of African countries see the relations between each other. Swahili is a language that countries that have nothing to do with Swahili argue that it should become the language in order to create a one Africa, one language space, right? So you have South Africa, Ghana, these are discussions. Should we make Swahili a national language? But this means that choosing one language from a different space as the major language, we then displaces the other languages that exist in that space. It's pretty much like English or French or Arabic or in these, in these cases. And so there is not only the discussion about, and, and so even within the discussion of African languages, there is still the discussion of value and power and hierarchy within these languages. I think that writers are the key people at the moment to change value of the language, but I do not think that this will happen overnight. Because like I showed with the keyboard, this is something that happened because of discussions and complaints of writers. So you have that there is a critical moment to intervene in which the ways in which these things are being created. I would mention that in Kenya, there was a short story competition called um, Tuvuta Pamoja, which was run by a tech com a software company in order to solicit short stories from 15 languages across Africa to create data to use for AI and machine learning. Because their argument was that not only do they need real-time speech, but they actually need a lot of literature, a lot of um, a, a lot of world building, a lot of imagination to feed their company. And so you have this collaboration between writers and software engineers in order to create this. Recently, there was also a competition um, for Swahili sci-fi in, in order to create the language for sci-fi in Swahili to create a dictionary out of writers who were uh, submitting to the short story. So I do think that writers provide a very critical moment for us to change this. But I think that, you know, without governmental support, without educational policy to back all of this, we are going to have a gap. I was just informing a colleague of mine that to upload a GA book on Amazon Kindle to sell, you can't do that. Amazon doesn't recognize GA. And so you cannot sell a GA book on Kindle. You have to put in some English and then choose English as the language, and then you can sell it. This means that the language is not even recognized to even be valuable in this space. And so that, yeah, it's, I said a lot, but basically I think that writers, I think that writers are the, are the key. They are the things that we need because without, even if you have the policy and you don't have the creation of the text, you, you, you cannot create a world for people in which technology values, you know, African languages. Yeah. So um this poem comes from a series of poems that the author has, the poet has written across different blogs. So he has submitted that across a series of places. It's not one compilation, but I actually see it as one compilation because the very specific style in which he writes these poems, almost all of them as dirges or as elegies, reference a popular Ghanaian or actually a popular African writer. And recently, some of the poems have also been referencing um, African-American poets. And so there's always this reference to another writer, which, you know, in my discussions with him, what he mentions is that he, he plays a lot with lineage and tries to insert himself into a lineage of African writers and black writers across, across the globe in order to, through the technique and through the craft of his poem, inscribe himself in these roots, which is a very interesting kind of meta way of thinking about himself because he already thinks about himself as one of the Kofi Awunos or one of Amaha Teidus, um, with just a few poems that he has published. 
And so his is really a, a technique that he uses, a strategy to place himself in conversation with these writers. With some of his poems, you know, um, you will see, for instance, lines or words that reference other poems of these poets. So he, he sees himself as extending their poem or continuing their craft. But uh, again, this is something that's very interesting, which I'm exploring in, in, another, in another thing. But all of these are dirges and elegies. And so that is an interesting way of also thinking, because this poem is about you know, the afterlives of slavery and the afterlives of colonialism through the castles um, on the coast, the slave castles on the coast of Ghana. So all his point, all these poems in which he uses this strategy and this technique, they are all dirges and elegies. Right. Yeah. As I was looking at the image, what struck me was that it seems that there's a lot of children's mm -hmm. stories, and I, I was wondering if you could unpack that. So I know you're a reader of children's stories, too, but you know this idea of the children's story versus the adult story, mm -hmm. and the image the stories with all these images, mm -hmm. and especially in a place where people are getting seven and mm -hmm. and nine mm -hmm. on their local mm -hmm. images that are given. Um, it, what is the relationship there? And then is it also, does that cause another problem on another level in terms of, to use your language, linguistic values? Mm -hmm. So like there are different linguistic values mm -hmm. associated with these different texts. And yet I see the, I see the reason why as well as the reason. So I just, just wondered your thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, I think I should mention that, so Market 54, the founder is Somali, Dutch, but she's based in London. And so her, ba her being based in London gives her access to a lot of writers who are based in Europe and um, in Naoyo's case, Canada. There, so this was just a screenshot of just part of the page, but she also has a lot of poems and a lot of short stories. And my, you know, in my discussions with her, what I noticed was that partly because she was starting out Market 54 and it's a private thing that she was working on, there was a sense of working on, working on shorter things that would give more text online. So if, if she had to work on a novel, that would take quite some time. But children's books are easier in the sense that they, are, they have less pages. Um, there are also poems, and then there are also short stories. But she, she, anyone can submit. So there's also the question of who is submitting to her, because not a lot of writers are writing novels in the languages and submitting to her. I know that there was a Swahili writer who tried to connect with her, but it was much easier for the Swahili writer to connect with the Swahili publishing house in Tanzania to sell it in Tanzania, because she sells the works online. And so she can, you can get the ebook from her, you can get the audio book, or she will ship it to you. Again, there's a question of cost, because if you live in Tanzania, to ship something from London to you is, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, I ordered one of her books once from Germany, and it was, the shipping cost was insane. Just, it, it cost more to ship it than the book itself. And so there is also that question of, of shipping it. In terms of children's books, what has been very interesting to me has been to see how when people become parents and they start speaking to their kids and their kids start learning, especially in the diaspora and even in the, in the country, they start to recognize the importance of the language. In one of the online sessions that I followed, it was for writers, but about half of the people who joined were not writers, they were parents who were figuring out how do I write something for my child to learn in the language. And so a lot of them came, and I remember that the, the facilitator asked, well, tell us about your ideas for what you want to write. And a lot of them were like, well, I don't actually have an idea. I was hoping that I would join the session and I would be taught how to come up with an idea and how to write something and how to publish it. And so there's that renewed sense of the importance of the language only at a different age once there is a child involved. But again, you know, when you... When you contrast this, specifically in Ghana, when you contrast this with the, with the administrative policies, educational policies, governmental policies, then there's a, a bit of a disconnect because 
the Ghana, Ghana Bureau of Languages, which is the official governmental institute for creating text, do does create text in languages, but only for the nine officially examinable languages in schools. So the other languages fall to the side. And then what you have on the other side is relates a lot to the way in which print literacy developed in a lot of African countries related to religion and missionary efforts. So translating the Bible into these languages, creating orthography precisely to translate the Bible into these spaces. So you will get a lot of Bible text in these spaces. And the Jehovah Witnesses do a lot of work actually for African languages because they would translate all of their texts into in different African languages and have a variety, you know, so, and I find that very interesting. And I think somebody should work on that, um, <laughs> you know, because you, you know, you would show up, um, you would see them by the road. And then sometimes I would check and you would have tree, ga, English, the, just variety of languages and not the Bible, right? It's the, the magazines that they produce in these languages. So they do a lot of work, but this is a religious aspect of it. And so the, the um, you know, you, you have this contrast where, there is the religious side that is growing and it's 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 the religious side that started a lot of the work and keeps growing where the, it is important in those cases for people to be able to read religious texts in their languages and the educational side which lags behind and then you have now a lot of parents who are thinking i need to you know teach my child these languages i think that the proliferation of information about how languages are dying. And it's kind of a renewed sense of Africanness is helping propel the, the need for such languages. Um, and this relates a lot to 2020, the George Floyd movement. A lot of these things had moved across globally, but it's kind of renewed a sense in people of what it means to be black, what it means to be African. And language it was a very critical thing that people started to focus on. In a space like Tanzania, a space like Kenya, this discussion about Swahili is on a completely different level because Swahili was never a language that was um, allowed to lag. It was a language that was deliberately created for the country. It was the, the new countries were deliberately used through Tanzania, through, through Swahili. But this is not something that other multilingual African countries did, right? We had English or French or Portuguese to do that. The question about the parents, that is something that I'm keen to explore later on as I go through, because it was something that popped up that I was not, um, I was not aware about. You know, when I joined a lot of these online groups, I assumed these were all writers. And then to find out that a lot of them were parents who were not writers, but just wanting to find something for their children. And so feeling the need to write something. Also interesting to know that a lot of them had stories that they had been told by their parents and they wanted to pass it on but they couldn't pass it on in English or French because that is not how they learned the stories, but these were oral stories. So they wanted to pass it on to their kids. Hmm. I think about more like, um... I did not speak out so well, like I'm speaking by my own French, my dad is in Mali, and I saw like in the diaspora, especially like children of African uh, parents, like there's nothing also like um, world games in African languages, mm -hmm. or even like uh, throwing boots or mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, I think it's also like a risk, like a looking at that, that you could also maybe be easily or. Uh, Instead of because I feel like also games mm. also a nice way to learn mm. uh, languages mm. and also we have like some cartoons and mm -hmm. like that. So I like, mm -hmm. there is this move like actually as you said from the diaspora because I think it was like important to my dad like he wanted to know like his language um, and I really want like to learn and I feel like books or games are a nice way to learn. Yeah. Um Calendars also are a thing, for instance, that I've seen multilingual calendars, calendars in different African languages. Um, puzzles, I've also seen puzzles. I've seen both. So I've been collecting some of a lot of these things, which kind of came out as an offshoot of my interest in text. So there, I have seen a lot of things. I've also seen app games on apps that you can do. A lot of work being done on, I think there are also work being done on cartoons, 
um, there are a lot of Swahili cartoons all over on YouTube. The, yeah, exactly. Um, for so I think this is a, an important moment to think about again the hierarchy of languages and which languages then have access to these spaces. And so if you think about a language like Ewe or a language like Ga, you don't get a lot of these things. But if you think about tree, I have seen tree cartoons. I've seen English cartoons dubbed over, you know, with tree. Um, and so it is, it's on one hand, it's a question of the population. How many people speak the language pushes the work that is done on the language. But you are right. A lot of this work is also done from the diaspora. And I think that dislocation forces a sense of a renewed sense of going back to a self, going back to the back to home or finding a new home that includes the texture of the previous home. And there's a lot of thought. I didn't touch on that in the presentation, but one of the things that pops up here a lot is memory and future. So how do we create a new future of what it means to be a diaspora? And so, I don't know, a Swahili person in the diaspora without thinking without trying to return to what our parents were in their countries. And this, I think, is a really new way of thinking about the, the, about the diaspora, because rather than an, an articulation of a return, there is a sense of just creating something new that encompasses both spaces or multiple spaces. But yes, that is a, that is a very good point. There is, a lot, there is a lot out there. One thing that also, I think one thing that is a challenge, it's, it's a great moment for, you know, academic writing, but it's a challenge, is the sustainability of these things. Because a lot of the time, these are individuals who do something because they feel like it, and then they move on. And so it's not sustained. And so the challenge is finding things that are sustained enough, long enough to be able to argue that this is actually a thing that is happening and not a one-off event that happened. And this has, is a question of platforms also, because where do people put up their things? Which platforms would they put them on? Do we have access to the platforms? Like I said, you cannot put a GAN book on, on Kindle. You can, you can sell a GAN book on Amazon, but if you want to publish it through Kindles, you cannot do that because the language is not recognized. And there are a lot of languages that are not recognized in this case. So in this case, you have to go through a, a separate platform. If you think about a thing like Market 54, it is a very exclusive space because if you don't know it, you won't find it. And that's the challenge that she faces with her, with her work because it appears democratic, it appears global, but in actual fact, it's not so global because you need to look for it to find it. Whereas, and she has argued, you go to Amazon, you just Google maybe a tree book and then it's like pops up a bunch of tree books. Um, I really like the part that you shifted to considering um, the actions of individuals towards uh, this challenge of preventing uh, marginalized languages from going extinct, but how to sustain them. And so I was wondering if you would consider or if you thought about um, further work looking at um, ways to convert uh, like personal passion projects to uh, preserve the mm -hmm. cultural um, languages and how that is integrated with uh, the colonization and the pressures of, say, in Ghana, uh, the government to only uh, include essentially Western languages. Um, and diminish the use of and um, continuation of native languages in school or the availability of them to be uh, shared. You mean if I would do something? If, like, you, were consider if you were considering an additional um, uh, project. Like academic or? Um, looking more at the uh, large uh, socio or social um, pressures mm -hmm. that are systemic mm -hmm. um, that apply the pressures that makes it to where uh, passion projects have been the main driving uh, 
potential solutions mm -hmm. for this issue mm -hmm. versus like um, what potential solutions that would arise that directly would target the systemic issues and pressures that are being um, applied by the government. Right, right. Um, well, right now, no. <laughs> right now, I've been focusing on the texts themselves. But that is a very interesting um, sociological way of, of, of a very sociological aspect of it. Um, and I think that relates a bit to his question or his comment earlier. That would, it would be an interesting aspect to look at for sure, because I think that the sustainability of these endeavors are very important in looking at, um, because without information about, about how they are being sustained and if they can be sustained, then a lot of these don't have a long life enough to create change in a lot of these spaces. So then, yes, thank you. That would be an interesting thing to look at. I would look at it sometime. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in the concept of authorization mm -hmm. that you noted, that you mentioned, and I was wondering if you could just talk about it a little bit more. And um, I wasn't quite sure what, so I wanted to know what the sort of different authorization processes are that you're seeing on like Twitter versus Facebook or TikTok. Yeah. So the poem that I talked about um, in Puano was published by was published by written and published by um Esa Samoa. And then when he shared it on his Twitter feed, one of his followers on Twitter then reshared it, retweeted it to her audience. And then she she tweeted about how she wished she could listen to the poem. And so one of her followers then recorded himself performing the poem to, an acost um, to a guitar. And then he shared it. And then, you know, he write, when you, when you, well, but when you, when you look at how he shared it, he simply said, um, at, you know, at Ama, I've granted your wish, something like this. And it's only when you get to the end of the video that you realize that this was actually a poem written by someone else. Because in the beginning, he writes created by himself. And then he performs the poem. And then at the end, he writes, this was originally written by this person. This doesn't appear anywhere in his retweeting only at the end of the video. And so this, this for me, this raises interesting questions about who the author is, but also permission and and I had someone ask me this question once about plagiarism, right? Um, and so this got me thinking a lot about poetry moving through different media and how then, if and how the author of the poem is then removed, which reminded me a lot of um, a lot of oral poems where we don't even know who the original author was because the poem as is performed sometimes spontaneously and as is performed through with a lot of different people so it has a lot of authors and so that's where I was thinking about when it comes to the author but in terms of Twitter and Facebook um so I was just looking at um Stephanie Bosch Santana's work on Zulu and in 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 South Africa on Facebook so blogs the um, short stories written on Facebook where you know you have the author as the owner of the page sharing his short story as and when he shares it and people commenting on the short story. And these are short stories that run as, as a series. So maybe every day then to be continued, then the next day then there's a new story to be continued. But it's the same story, right? It's just broken up into different pieces. Whereas on Twitter, this ability to have it on your own, own in quotes, page, continue it over the time is removed because the sharing ability to share the page and retweet on that page changes who the author is, creates a new author to what was already, already written to a completely new audience. So the audience don't keep coming back to the original page of the author, but keep going to the new pages as and when tweeted and retweeted by new people. And so I was thinking about the difference between an author on Facebook and an author on Twitter and the difference between the life of the text on Facebook and the life of the text on Twitter, 
Well, on Facebook, it's it seems inward that the text is there and the comments surround the text and they just keep coming to the same thing. But on Twitter, it just appears outward. It just keeps moving towards new life, new authors, new retweets. And it's possible to see it. Um, and in this case, you could see the poem on Twitter and not even know who the original author was because it's a lot of people did not even link to him. They did not retweet his original poem. They just retweeted from the new performed video on, on Twitter. Um, part of my work, which I didn't share here, was looking at why people pre pre preferred the oral of listening to the poem to reading the poem. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the rhyming of the poem. It, sound, it sounds great when you hear it, when you're listening to it. But in terms of the authorship, I do not know if the guy who, the one who performed the poem is friends with the poets. I don't know if they even follow each other because I was not able to check this before. But later when I checked, they followed each other, but I don't know if they followed each other before. And so um, that, was, that was how I was looking at it, you know, the, the different ways in which the author is proved as the author of the poem on Facebook and versus on Twitter and how the structure of Twitter lends itself to the, this different way of being the author and this different way of seeing the new poem without being linked to the old poem or the original poem. And it's important to know that the original poem was posted on a blog. So it was not even written on Twitter, it was posted on a blog and then simply shared. So the idea was for people to move to the blog to see the full poem. And then that really wasn't happening because this guy then created a new poem, a video that everyone just kind of kept going to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is an affinity because Twitter itself is there, it's forms for rapid engagement, right? So, rapidly sharing things, rapidly um, commenting on things, and, and it's being shared across a large audience. So, I think inherently, Twitter, these two things are linked. But the issue here also has, because with a meme, usually it's like, it's a picture, right? That you see something, but this here was a video. And what I noticed was that a lot of people, you know, were commenting on it, but not on, I could tell that people had not actually listened to the whole thing because they would comment on parts of the poem. You know? So it's like, okay, they didn't actually listen to the whole video. And there were a lot of, oh, this sounds really great. I wish I had read the whole poem, right? So these were a lot of the comments that were coming up. Like, I'm happy to listen to it rather than to see it. So I do think that um, the form in which, it, in which it takes, in this case, it was not a picture, um, changes the way in which people engaged with it. But rapidly being able to share it, like one is able to share a meme, helped propagate the poem, helped move it which will be different from a novel, for instance, because you will not be able to, to put a, mo a novel up. Um, and so I do think that, I, I do think that these things are, are linked in that, in that sense. But precisely because this was not a picture of the poem, one would have to see what happens when the picture of a poem is shared and how that moves within these spaces. What I, of course, what we know is that a lot of pithy, short forms of poems are taking out. So it's like three, three lines of a poem will be taking out and it will be shared all over the place. And that becomes, that takes on the life of the poem itself in place of the original poem. Um, and so for that, that would relate a lot to your question because that moves easily and it's easily seen and it's easier seen. Whereas in this case, it was a whole video and I could tell, I could just tell that people didn't actually listen to the whole video. They just like listen to a bit. And then they like, I like, this sounds really great. The guitar sounds really great but not, th there wasn't a lot of engagement with that content, especially getting to the end. And so you could tell that, that's how I could tell that people didn't know who the original poet was because then they kept telling him that, oh, you wrote such a great poem, whereas he didn't actually write the original poem. And the only way I knew this because I had seen the original poem. And so I could, I was following the life of the poem. You know, I would 
search for the poem and see how it was moving through. What would be interesting, I think, moving on is to see if people start taking out short parts of poems in African languages and sharing them. And if then these moves as fast in these circles as memes, as you mentioned. And of course, because this means that it's exclusive to a certain group who speak that language. But this is something that I have not yet seen. What I have seen, I haven't followed that in my research, but what I have seen are just short parts of video. So like a screenshot of a, a video where the text is written out, like moving around. So that I have seen in, in, in Ghana. I've seen that in Ghana, I've seen that in Tree. Um, but yeah. The screen, like someone just taking a screenshot of a part to move it around. Yeah. But that would be interesting for follow <laughs> in another line in the work. Thank you. Um, I also um, really appreciate your poems. Hmm. Uh, which I found to just be uh, so stark and so uh, potent and powerful. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you could just, because I know you had to be a queer scholar in the book, but could you say a few words about your creator work mm -hmm. and also whether you do work in African languages with what you write in? Right. What, okay, so so what is the choice of English versus right. uh, what, and you, you're so multilingual. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, so my my poetry, as you notice, thinks a lot about lineage, a lot of, about the body, about motherhood, and about grief. In terms of language, my poems are really in English, but you would notice that I do incorporate words from mostly Ga, but I have tried in other languages into the poems, just because a lot of these words opening up a cultural context that would not exist in Ga for me. And so um, in the last poem that I wrote, for, that I read, for instance, where I say, I've been trying to find language that does not swallow my consolation. And no matter how they say it, sorry, po, po, there is something. So here, what I have the word sorry and then the Ga translation of the word sorry, but the two words in the same line without, you know, put it in brackets or something to see that this is a translation. And this was a um, an active choice to be able to include that familial lineage into the poem through the language, but also to re-emphasize the idea of sorry through two languages. And so this is something that I do see, I do do throughout the poems. And um, I mean, this poem I didn't read, but for instance, I would just read this part. It says, praise your Lord God of miracles and praise your pastor who reminds you your father was a twin and ends by saying, Api benene, which means next year by this time, which sounds like a prophecy, you will soon be pregnant, a declaration, white is the color of celebration, an irony, white is your grief in the present. And so I have this, the ga word, the ga sentence, Api benene, and then I say, which means next year by this time. But then when I go down and I say, which sounds like a prophecy, I explore the Ga culture context of what, of what white means. And so here, white, a prophecy, you will soon be pregnant because when you have a baby and you do the what we call the outdooring, which is done seven days after you give birth to present your baby and sh sh um, introduce your baby's name, you were white, right? So white, when I say Afi Benene, which means next year by this time, I talk about white in this culture context but also white as a declaration and white as the color of celebration because white is what we wear to celebrate. And then white as an irony, white is your grief in the present because in this case, a persona does not have a baby, right? So white becoming, white becoming grief. And so um, using Afi Benene because that is what you know, people say next year by this time. And so when people see you, oh, Afi Benene, you will have a baby or next year by this time, you will be happy. Next year by this time, this. So I explore what then, in this context, what it means white within this context in this gas space. Whereas if I feel that if I had just written next year by this time, it doesn't really make sense. But happy benene, which is um it is a, it is a term people use. You know, when you say happy new year in Ghana, we would then continue with saying happy benene. Because um, you know, in English you say happy new year, many happy returns. 
It's just that. But in Ghana, when you say Happy New Year, you are exploring what the new year will mean for the person. So it's always like a declaration of this year will mean this for you. This year will mean that for you. And that's what I feel that the language enabled me to do to explore this cultural context. Whereas if I just use English, I feel that I would not have been able to just, you know, explore this thing so much. Um, just try to see if I have like one last. Well, then the poem that I read about lineage, that is really about mother tongue and, and translations of, of the word. So for instance, here, when I say, I build a home out of loss and split myself to sow his embarrassment into me. In Ga, I thirst for his shame. Ehien Igbo, literally his face is dead. Because Ehien Igbo literally in Ga means, in English means his face is dead, right? Um, because death is the lineage I have inherited. So that expression, Ehien Igbo, which, mean, which is about embarrassment, which I talk about in the first line, then helps me to explore this idea of lineage being dead, which I do feel that I would not be easily able to render um, in English. And so that is that is what I do in the in my poems. I try to think about cultural concepts that I've not easily rendered in English, in Ga or other languages into the work. Um, that was your question, right? Yeah. But otherwise I don't write. Maybe someday. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. 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 With us, this has been so enlightening, and um, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs>